Sin is not here, and I'm Pirate Sin. And I'm Hulk. <laughs> Train wreck. Boom. So we've ditched one nose and grabbed ourselves another, and now it's fine. Sen will be back another time. Uh, we haven't done a show in a long time. No, it's been a while. School got really crazy towards the end of the semester there, but now it's over. We are all free forever. Hooray. Well, not forever. Oh. Now it's sad. Pretty close there, though. We're free for like three weeks. <laughs> Yay, <laughs> free for three weeks. You tell yourself you're probably free, free forever. I mean, just for the sake of feeling good about it. Ah, three weeks sounds like forever to me at this point. So, what else happened since the last time we had a show? Uh, we saw Skyfall. We saw Skyfall. Again. I saw it three times and Pixie's seen it twice. <laughs> and I think Sam already talked about that a little bit. Uh, I talked about it on the To Kill a DJ ah, show, yeah, but right. without spoilers. Yeah, so we can do that. Have you seen Skyfall, Paul? I have not. I am actually outside of this conversation. I'm going to have to like smile and nod <laughs> as you guys ruin the plot for me, but I'm okay with that. Warning, um, James Bond dies. Oh my god. For real. Oh my god. It is not just the thing that happened in the first five minutes uh, where they pretend that he dies for real. No, actually he doesn't die. Because this is James Bond. It's like saying Doctor Who dies. Well, the Doctor. I'm sorry. The doctor. Everybody, everybody will jump down my throat immediately for referring to that, <laughs> that, that person Every as. Every in our audience is now going to strangle you. I'm They're sorry. They're going to find where you live and, then kill and come after you. That's like saying the Doctor is dead, which. Well, I guess we could cut that whole bit out, and then no one will know that you. No, made that no, you're keeping no, that in there. I must pay. You're, you're, you're keeping that in there. My <laughs> sins must be atoned for with suffering. That being said, um... We also saw The Hobbit. Yes, and that was much more recent. And all of us have seen that. We have seen that, and it was so. very, very good. Even though my comrades over here decided to talk throughout the entire thing. It was really long. <laughs> like, never go see a movie with these guys if you like your peace and quiet and like taking in all of all of movie kind. <laughs> but they, always they come talk. see movies with us if you like having fun <laughs> and good times. <laughs> That's the point. It's a social experience. <laughs> Fun and good times. Now the, uh, okay, so interesting little mini story. I brought in a couple of friends from, uh, uh, in town here. And, um, so myself, uh, myself and Dylan went and then we kind of brought together our own introspective parties. And, uh, my buddies that came with, uh, texted me after they'd left. It's like, your friends are really loud and yeah, or need to use her. And, and so I've been giving them crap there and ever since, but it's fun times. So, see, I have also played Assassin's Creed 3, which I initially liked a lot and then got super disappointed with. That, that is probably my whole explanation of Assassin's Creed 3. It is more of the same, there are no climbing puzzles, and I liked it a lot at first, but then I got super down on the entire series because it's been the exact catalyst? same thing for a long time. Uh, specifically, it was the realization that they took out the climbing puzzles, because it's always been that the most interesting thing about Assassin's Creed is the design of the world, the visuals, yeah. and the animations of your character as he moves around the yeah. world. So there would be these, uh, like, sort of self-contained levels in 2 and Brotherhood, where you'd be, like, in this lost sub-basement of the Vatican... And everything is falling apart, and there's lots of rotting wood and stuff. And you have to figure out which parts of the walls you can climb on in order to get up to another level, in order to make a long jump, in order to grab onto this rope and swing around the corner. And that is pretty much non-existent in Assassin's Creed 3. And I mean, there's sort of a narrative necessity for that, because Assassin's Creed 2 and Brotherhood took place in Rome after the fall of the Roman Empire, so it's like there's all of this abandoned catacombs to work with for making these climbing puzzles. But when they took that out, it sort of made naked the fact that the combat is nothing but quick time events. It is, it's very similar combat to Batman Arkham Asylum or Arkham City, but the enemy types are much fewer and there are no gadgets. And so it's like, there's, so it's just mash the attack button and dodge? It, it is almost that. There's four enemy types in Assassin's Creed 3. There are the Regulars, which <laughs> that is actually the historical name of the British soldiers. But there are also the regular enemies, and they can be killed in a lot of ways. If you just walk up to one and mash attack, 
then they perform a, quote, execution. Uh, if you kill one dude and then immediately hit attack and point the stick at another dude, that does a combo kill, and regulars are susceptible to that. The other three types, uh, snipers, jaegers, and grenadiers, are not. And so, it's the four enemies, regulars, snipers, jaegers, and grenadiers, and each of them just have checkboxes next to the ways they can be killed. Uh, for Jaegers, there's only one thing you can do to them, which is wait for them to attack you, and then hit the counter button, which will put you in a slow-mo state where you have two options. You can either hit the attack button for a counter kill, which they're not susceptible to, or you can hit the jump button for a disarm. So you have to disarm them, and then do an execution on them by just mashing the attack button in the world. Uh, Grenadiers, almost exactly the same. Not vulnerable to combo kills, uh, not vulnerable to counter kills, um, only vulnerable to executions after they've been disarmed. And it's like, um, there is a subtle distinction in the grenadiers have a special attack where their triangle over their head turns yellow instead of red, which will cause when you press the counter button for you to do a dive roll to get out of the way rather than a counter attack. And you can dive behind their backs, and they're vulnerable to be killed if you're behind them. But it's like, it just needs more enemy types for this combat to be interesting. It's There's like a number of ways enemies can be killed, but the only type of enemy that is susceptible to combo kills is the regulars. And once you've played like the first three hours of the game, they very rarely show up. So combat turns into, you stand around with like 40 Jaegers and Snipers and Grenadiers standing around you. You just wait for one to attack you, you counter it, you disarm them, and then you execute them. Repeat. For 30 minutes. And I was always sad in number 2 and Brotherhood because there were not enough enemies for me to kill. They've sort of swung that the other way in that... You can just be slaughtering guys. It's still possible to slaughter guys at a breakneck pace, but they'll keep coming forever. So I'll be standing here in 1700 Boston with a pile of corpses, like 400 dudes high, and they just keep running up to me. And it's like, it'd be nice if I could get out of the alert state by killing everybody, and then I'm out of the alert state because there's nobody else here, but they just spawn forever. That's, the infinite spawns always annoy me. Well, well, here's a question for you. Um, you did say that the the parkour aspect was greatly diminished in Assassin's Creed Three. Is it still there, or like how have they changed that up to? The engine is basically the same, and there's a lot of animations that are reused. Um, so, what you actually do for the climbing is almost exactly the same. It's just the world you're doing the climbing in is less interesting. Hmm. Um, a lot of viewpoints that you basically just high structures in the world that you have to get to the top of to fill in your map in previous games would consist of towers and you'd have to rotate around these towers a few times because you'd be on like the north face and the only grip that you can get up is on the south face and you can only go around on the east side so you'll be like i i gotta go to another side i can't get around on the west okay get around on the east and then I can get up. And then sometimes you'd even have to go around and then drop down in order to get on a different path and climb up. And so even though you're climbing a tower, it's you have to make decisions a lot. Whereas in the churches, and churches are just about the only thing that you climb in Assassin's Creed 3, you can climb them from any direction by just holding forward. That will get you to the top. Wow. And so there's no decisions to be made, so that's not very fun. I mean, you still watch it, and it still looks cool, but there is one particular change to the climbing mechanics that irks me, which is there was a move called the Climb Leap introduced in 2, very, very late in 2, like after you'd been playing the game for 20 hours, that let you, when you were holding onto a ledge, hit the jump button to fling yourself up, and then you can hit the grab button in order to span a distance that you could not previously span simply by holding the forward button. And so uh, this was a sort of a timing thing. You have to A, 
make the judgment call that if I jump, there's going to be something for me to grab onto. And once you've made the jump, you have to time the grab in order to get to this high height. And <laughs> they introduced that in 2, and it was super cool, and I liked it, because you have to make decisions. You have to assess the world and know when to use this move. And then they sort of tread on it in a way that wasn't a problem, was just kind of dumb in Brotherhood and Revelations, which is that they made their be a special item that you'd purchase, the glove in Brotherhood, that just enabled the Climb Leap move. And that was pretty... That's that's normal. It's progression, you have to buy the item, and it unlocks the move. As a result of that, the item was optional, and the world did not necessarily require the Climb Leap ever. You could always shimmy around if you're willing to go the whole way around a building to find another way up. Or you could use the shortcut if you had purchased the item and knew that you should use it. In Revelations, they introduced a new item called the Hook Blade, and this had a few neat consequences because you could zip line off clothes lining with the hook on the end of your hidden blade. That sounds like the world's sturdiest clothesline. <laughs> yes, all it's it seems like you should probably cut these clotheslines by accident at some point because Because you're a heavy dude. This hook <laughs> you will take this hook and you will jam it into dudes' faces and it will kill them, so it's like apparently this hook is sharp, but when I'm zip lining on clotheslines it's not a problem. But we don't worry about physics too they much. They just have the best clothesline manufacturers in the world there. But they the introduced this, for. quote, new move called the Hook Leap, which is exactly the Climb Leap in terms of gameplay and in terms of the distance you span. So it's like, okay, the gameplay of assessing, assessing distances in this world is the whole draw of this series. So you think you're going to pull one over on your audience by introducing a new move with a new narrative hook. And, and you're saying that, oh, this is a whole different thing, but you're like, I can jump the same distance that I could before. These are the same distances, I know this. And it's like, no, this is totally different. It's like, okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> you pretend this is new. The viewers are morons trope. <laughs> yes. I, I still have to press my buttons, and I'm happy about that. Um, in 3, they simply removed it. It's It's the agility of Connor is the exact same as the agility of Ezio. You can move all of the same distances, except for the climb leap distance. You just can't do that anymore. And so, I was like, oh, so the one opportunity in the structures you had where I would have to make a decision, I'd have to be like, oh, I, I pushed forward and then it stopped working. So now I have to try and jump and catch. But no, you just push forward the whole time and that gets you to the top of any building. Um, nominally the new system they introduced was the forest, and you're climbing around on trees, and that has a new set of animations, and there's a kind of a neat one where you can dodge around a tree trunk if you have two branches lined up on opposite sides of a tree trunk, and just sort of, in a very physics-defying way, run, and then slide to the side, and then slide back, and get on the branch on the other side of the trunk. If the tree happens to grow in a very specific way, which I imagine is more common than in real life. Yes, all <laughs> trees are designed in this kind of mysteriously climbable way, including there is a lot of fallen trees that form ramps to get up onto trees. So it's like, man, it's these trees are falling down all the time. <laughs> it's really useful, but dang. So... It, mostly, Assassin's Creed 3 is just the same as before, but with fewer elements. And it's like, it it needed more stuff in it. It needs more gameplay. It's It's got cool animation still, but it kind of has no gameplay at this point. And I've, I've done all of this climbing for 80 hours now, and I needed to be mixed up a little bit. And you loved those games. I really, really did. And... I loved the narrative of those games. Like, uh, there was a core element of the original Mass Effect that sort of inspires a lot of my love for the whole Mass Effect series. And that is just the notion that the Reapers are going to kill everybody, and we have to stop them. And it's like, we don't know why, but, and potentially, if you have only played Mass Effect 1... 
it is, like, philosophically impossible to understand why the Reapers are killing everything. And, but it is just, this is the clear threat, and we have to deal with it, whatever it takes. And that, that, that hook really got me into the whole series. And that's what carried me all the way through. I mean, there's, there's lots of other substance to the Mass Effect storytelling. All of the storytelling in Mass Effect is amazing. But that kernel was powerful. And there is a kernel at the heart of Assassin's Creed, which is, there's, in number one, there's this artifact called the Apple of Eden, which has mind control mm -hmm. powers. And Templars are like, we should totally do mind control. And Assassins are like, no, free will is good. And so it's this, it's this very clear split, and you're fighting for free will against mind control. That, that is, there is a very clean, simple kernel at the heart of it. And then they added sort of a, a new element in two, which is that the sun is going to explode, and maybe we should put our free will versus mind control debate on the back burner in order to prevent the sun from exploding, killing everything. And I was like, okay. And then we've just sort of not gotten to our destination. We've been fighting this fight, but we haven't been making any progress ever. And so it's like, eh. We're, we're going to have to actually stop the sun from exploding if you want me to be interested. Part of, part of what's important about engagement in games is that you, the player needs to feel like they are doing something worthwhile. That, that There needs to be an accomplishment that you can point at and go... I did that. And that is sort of getting to not be the point when you're continuing with the same conflict and the same mechanics time and time again. Like, Revelations was a stretch, but I, I liked Revelations, and then Assassin's Creed 3 was a stretch too far. I, I was patient through their one totally insubstantial game, but not two totally insubstantial games. Mm. But, I mean, it, it's still competent, it's still well-made, and the combat is not as good as Batman combat, as Rocksteady Batman combat, because you don't have your Batarangs and your uh, Bat Claw and your Explosive Gel and all of your other nice gadgets that you have as Batman, and you don't have as many types as e of enemies because... Batman, you have the ones that have the stun sticks, which you need the cape stun for. You have the titans, and th there's a whole bunch of enemy types in Batman, and there's not in Assassin's Creed. But the the core of it is still fun for a little while. It's it's if you want to play it, play it, and you will enjoy it. But I was disappointed with it just because I, I liked the previous game so much. I guess. It's because I was invested that I turned so negative. The, the real situation was just that I got bored. It's like, well, I'm bored now. Why am I here? But but that, that, that inspired a very negative reaction to me because I had been so positive previously. Like, you were, as far as I was aware, still working on that uh, cosplay. I am, and I, I still intend to build a nice Ezio costume at some point, probably for Gen Con 2013. But Ezio is a very visually interesting character. He's got lots of sh stuff hanging off of his um, clothes. In fact, one of the things I liked a ton about the original Mass Effect was the fact that all of their weapons are very prominently mounted on their suits. And when you switch weapons, your character folds up the weapon he's, she is currently wielding and puts it where it belongs and then pulls out the other weapon. It's like, oh, this this is not just coming out of hyperspace. These things exist in the world. And uh, Ezio's character design is very much the same way. That's actually one of the really cool things about Borderlands 2 as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Borderlands 2 has the, the class customizations wind up being like books most of the time that are hooked to your belt. And your shield is this sort of little glowy tech piece that's also sitting on your belt. But they look like they do in the menus, but they show up in the world. Uh, the, the guns also show up on your person. They Do the guns show up on your person very... Well, it's the ones that are not... It's a person thing, so obviously you're not going to be looking at them on your own body a whole lot. Right. But... 
It is nice that they exist in the world in Borderlands, but when you switch between them, they just sort of warp in and warp out. That's also because you're playing... Yeah, you're playing it in a first-person mode, though, so, I mean, like, it would be... The only way you could really do something different from that is if you swapped out to a third-person mode for just the weapon swap. Right, although... That would be annoying. That would be annoying. Right, although the trick is... the, The reason that I'm concerned with this is in multiplayer which is really the primary use case for Borderlands 2. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know that many people would advocate for playing Borderlands single-player when multiplayer is available. Well, as far as the first board, I, I mean, I haven't really gotten invested into the second Borderlands yet, but as far as the first Borderlands went, I, I must have did well over 60 hours in, in just the single-player alone. I love that game. Uh, they're, they're totally good games, and I mean, I would recommend playing them single-player if you have no other option. But it's it's when you can play multiplayer, it's... Oh, no, sure, totally sure absolutely. But... Because the... The option still is there, though, and it still is a good time regardless, yeah. but... As, as such, animation assets would not necessarily be totally wasted, because I think a lot of the uh, design decisions of Borderlands were based on multiplayer. Yeah, mm-hmm. And so, I, I would like it if the... I, I personally don't tend to play Borderlands if I'm going to be playing by myself. And me neither. I'm weird. Well, I, it's no, just, I support I will, you. I will, I, will, I, think... I will elect to play something else if I'm going to be playing by myself. I think plenty of people do what Paul did and play Borderlands single player, but I, but the I think multiplayer the, is so fun. the multiplayer yeah, is, is so fun. It is, but like I, the way I always looked at it is, I looked at I, I, when I jumped into when I got myself vested in Borderlands, I did it for the same reason that I got myself vested into like Diablo from back in the day. Like it's just it's good. It, 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 it's it's fun dungeon crawling, except this time it's with guns. But I characterize Borderlands as a single player MMO, and it is that in yep. a lot of ways because it's got the loot treadmill. And it's got the world persistence wherein there is never any backwards movement in world state if you die. The anything you do is done forever. And actually, that's kind of cool. That's kind of a non MMO thing about it. Is like, uh, for example, we do one quest with uh, Ellie, Scooter's sister, uh, where you collect little statuettes of her and set them up around her shop. Those are there forever now. And because you are the only entities in this world, you kind of make substantial changes, like, a minor spoiler, at some point you move Sanctuary. I was just, I was going to put that in a non-spoiler way, jackass. (laughs) (laughs) The specific, I don't think. I was just going to say, a quest hub moves, but. (laughs) There's only really the one notable quest hub. Not true. The specifics of how it moves are way more interesting than the fact that it does. But, um, yeah, the Borderlands 2, because you are the only person in the world, you can do things that change the world for everybody forever. But if you go kill a boss and yeah. walk away, the boss comes back, mm-hmm. which is how MMOs work. Mm-hmm. So it, it is a nice so mixture of the two. The environmental changes are persistent. The character ones kind of aren't. Yeah. This is kind of a weird way to look at it. But Borderlands 2 is great. And it would be nice if there were more animations. I, I like animations. Yeah. Your, your guns that are not equipped show up on your character model, mm-hmm. but they do not move smoothly between your hands and their holstered position. Yeah, okay, I can get that. Whereas they do in Mass Effect 1, and I was kind of... I was but again, that would only serve as a benefit to a third party who is looking at you. <laughs> yeah. And the aesthetic of Borderlands in general is that everything warps everywhere. Yeah. I mean, Including your dead ass. <laughs> and if you get a car at the car stations, the catcher ride, it, this is something that you see from the first person perspective. The car just materializes and sort of has an animation for materializing by layers, but it just it just comes in. And so this is sort of a narrative fact of the Borderlands universe is that IRL things downloads. teleport. But Ezio is pretty, and I want to cosplay him because he has cool animations. That's the TLDR. <laughs> <laughs> Would that be the too long didn't listen? Indeed. TLDL. Well, if you thought that this was too long to listen to, then you're going to have difficulty watching The Hobbit. Because that movie is very long. <laughs> it's great. Oh, that was a brilliant but... segue. <laughs> I'm going to ruin it by pointing it out. TLDW. 
The Hobbit did not contain the whole Hobbit, and I, I went to see it with Paul and my sister, and my sister was not aware of the fact that it was going to be segmented into multiple parts when she saw it, and so she, in her own words, she walked out of the theater with a massive case of blue balls. <laughs> <laughs> they get very close to the end, and she, she said that... They don't even get to the mountain. <laughs> they get through the, the one mountain. They, they, do, they do not get to the are, misty mountain. Are we going mountain. to spoil this? Well... I, I think that people should be no be aware of the plot of the Hobbit from Tolkien. Even if they even if they've just watched the Lord of the Rings, they should know the know the at least the basic basic elements. Yeah, Bilbo gets the I Ring of Power and survives. Are, in case for some reason there are children who listen to this, God help you. <laughs> children, stop being children. Become adults. Read the Hobbit. That's a better thing to be. That's, that's only the way you become an adult in this world. I, I guess, but. The time I originally read The Hobbit was my fifth grade teacher read it aloud to the class during yeah, lunch. Yeah, the, 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 well, it, mine wasn't at lunch, but it was It was also, it was no, it wasn't my fifth grade year, it was my third grade year, um, and they did it as an actual class assignment. We did it as an audio book, so. Uh, subsequently, I listened to it again as an audio book when I was driving across country for the previous Gen Con. It is, audiobooks are great for cross, for cross country drives. I may have to get that off you. I have it as an MP3, so that will work. Um, the movie holds very closely to the book in a lot of respects, insofar as it specifically quotes dialogue from the book a lot. But then sometimes it changes, like, broad, broad strokes elements of the plot, which is weird. Uh, I want to specify a particular way where it quotes dialogue from the book, which is that it opens... The very opening, yeah. And Bilbo is, like, writing a memoir to Frodo, and he's like, Frodo, you have often asked me if I have told you the whole truth about my journey. I can say that I've told you the truth, but not the whole truth. And then it, he, it goes into the opening lines of the book, which is, in, the hole, in a hole in the ground lived a hobbit. Not a dirty, smelly hole, like... But it's like... Okay, this is Bilbo talking to Frodo. Like, Frodo no. knows what a dang hobbit hole is. In fact, it was Bag End, where you live, your dang house. You know the one. You know what a hobbit hole is. You're a hobbit. <laughs> it's not even just a hobbit hole. It's the same one in which you currently reside. I think we're aware of this concept. That does not need to be explained to him. So yeah, trying to force that into character dialogue. As far as dramatic relevance to the audience, though, it was a cool little tie. And it was, I mean, it was cool on. to think that, yes, these are the opening words of the book, verbatim. And, and uh, notionally, the book The Hobbit is Bilbo's memoir. Like, it's supposed to be in-universe, Bilbo wrote The Hobbit. Um, but they, they framed it as he wrote it as a letter to Frodo rather than just as a novel, which made it seem a little funny. But it, it was definitely super cool to hear the exact quotes from the book. Well, here's an idea. Since we don't actually see it in its written form, it's possible, headcanon here, uh, that perhaps that's just a preface to him, and then it switches over to him writing the book. Yeah, that, that, that is a reasonable way to frame it. Yeah. And at the like start a, of... Know, well, yeah, yeah because at, at the start of the movie, you do see, you do see uh, Bilbo writing this memoir, and, and Frodo comes up to him, and he, and he sort of uh, has a small conversation with Bilbo, is like, what are you doing? And Bilbo tries to cover up his words, saying it's not, it's not ready yet. And... The very beginning of Fellowship of the Ring, the Peter Jackson Fellowship of the Ring, consists of Bilbo writing the words, The End, at the end of... The, a Hobbit's Tale, An Unexpected Journey. Uh, he closes it, and then the 111st birthday happens. So, like, that is the bridge between Fellowship of the Ring and the Peter Jackson The Hobbit movie. It, it ends, it starts with Bilbo writing The Hobbit, and Fellowship starts with him finishing The Hobbit. Um, but... The way that Bilbo decided to go on the journey in the book was that Bilbo kind of got his courage screwed up the night before, and he had decided that he wants to do this thing. And then he goes to bed, and nobody wakes him up. And tomorrow morning, he's like, nobody is home. 
And that scene is enacted in film pretty well in this movie. But then he's like, oh, well, maybe that was all just a bad dream and I don't have to deal with any of this. And he's like, I, I was committed to this the night before, but now I'm not going to do it. But then somebody shows up and is like, dude, we, we told you to be at the tavern by noon and it is 1145. You got to go. Whereas in the movie... They just leave without him. They're like, okay, you didn't sign your contract. You're not part of the adventuring party. We're just going to go. And then the morning after, he's like, oh, they, they left without me. I don't, I don't want them to leave without me. And then he decides to leave the door without somebody pushing him out the door in the movie. Mm. And uh, Peter Campbell wrote a book called A Hero's Journey, which describes, quote, the monomyth and... Uh, aligns a lot of histor of stories throughout uh, folklore and history and just many, many, many stories follow this particular framework of the monomyth. And there's a couple of ways the beginning can go and they're framed as refusing the call, um, accepting the call, and things like that. And they, they switched it from one to the other between the book and the movie. And I feel like well, That's at a really least, important thing. Yeah. Uh, the purpose of the book A Hero's Journey was that this structure is embedded in human consciousness automatically at a very primal level. Like, these elements are things that people care about. And so switching from refusing the call to accepting the call is important. Uh, but the the way they sort of made up for it later in the scenes where uh, Frodo tries to walk away from the adventuring, or Bilbo, Bilbo tries to walk away from the adventuring party. So first the Doctor Who fans are going to get you. <laughs> and, and now, now the Lord, the Lord of the Lord Rings of the fans Rings are going to kill me. Are going to kill you. I just have to there's hide from entire, all geeks. There's going to be an entire mob with, like, pitchforks and torches waiting. Well, they'll just catch me at Gen Con 2013. They'll know where to find me. So I'm in stealth mode right now, but... I'll just burn down the Indiana Convention Center to get me. It'll completely depend on how well you do that cosplay. <laughs> no, the, no, they'll <laughs> burn down the Indiana Convention Center, and then it'll turn into, like, this timed climbing puzzle, where you'll, you'll run into this room, and they'll be like, because the roof rafters are burning, one of them will burn through at a spot and fall down, forming a ramp, which will get you up to the second story, and then it'll be awesome. <laughs> And so I'll, I'll just be an assassin, is what'll happen. It'll test your parkour ability. Yes. It'll be great. <laughs> but then they sort of... The the movie of The Hobbit covers this I element think. where he initially rejected the call by having him try and leave the party later. So I, I was miffed at the very beginning of the movie that they had changed this, but then they kind of fix it when he tries to run away and then is inspired to stay by extraordinary circumstances that the party needs his help. And so it's like, oh, okay. Well, you've sort of slotted yourself back into the right monomyth slot now. So this took longer than necessary. And maybe th this is why... <laughs> Fool of a took. <laughs> this is why the movie is three hours long. But they got there. I'm going to take credit for having made the worst joke of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like, regardless of anything, we do have to keep in mind that they are trying to... They, they do need... Peter Jackson is legendary for making very, very long movies. Um, D but long things for the sake well, of being long. <laughs> well, okay, but, but, but keep, but keep Historically, mind, keep he has made very long movies out of very substantial... Right, source material. right. But he's still trying to make a three-part trilogy out of one book now. And I mean, like, there, there's. I, 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 I personally say, give him the, give him the credit. He's, he's doing something pretty substantial with, with something that really doesn't have as much substance as you would normally want for some, for, for that. And he is pulling, um, things that are outside of the canon of the Hobbit proper that Tolkien did write in order to do that, which I think yeah, is kind of cool. Pulling from the Cimmerillion and stuff. Yeah, but, that's cool. Paul is absolutely right about that. That. Uh, but I would also say, might be mistakenly under the impression that we don't like this movie. Well, for, it, <laughs> it, it, just, it just they keep complaining about it, and I was like, you guys liked it. 
Ah. <laughs> Every single time we talk about a movie on this podcast, we have only any movie. <laughs> I, you you tell me to talk about Citizen Kane, and I will tell you that Citizen Kane is too long and it needs to be shorter. And this movie was three hours long, which is just Two monstrous. Hours and, 50 minutes, and you know what? Whatever. It didn't feel like it was three hours long. <laughs> no, it, really it, didn't. it felt like it was two hours and twenty minutes long, which which is a huge testament to how well it's made. Because three hours is just is just huge, and it, it felt tighter than it actually was. And tight editing is super important too. It just, it's just as I was as I was sitting there watching this with Dylan, uh, he keep he kept turning over to me saying like, "Oh, they've gotten from the canon again. Oh, they've gotten from the canon again." And it's all like they need to extend it for three movies. And he said, "Let them do it." <laughs> okay. Ah! When, when I said that Paul was exactly right with the things before, that what he had been saying when we were in the theater was repeatedly that they need to make it in three movies, and I was like. Why do they need to make it in three? They because choose. That's what, that's what they, they decided to do. To make it if in. they're going to do that, though, they have to do it right. And I think they're they're honestly off to a good start. I'm sorry. I I, I gotta I gotta give myself. Or I gotta give credit to Jackson where credit is due. I, I thought he did a very good job, and I'm looking vast. I'm looking vastly forward for, to yeah. the next two. So. That being said, I, I would I would say I did enjoy this a lot. I still think this particular movie could have been shorter under the context of. Accepting that there's going to be three of these things, this one could have been shorter. <laughs> I, I agree with Pixie. There's a, there's a couple particular scenes I have in mind when I say that. And there are some scenes that go on for a long time, and that's fine, and they totally work. There is an escape scene in particular that goes on for a long time, and that's fine, and it totally works. Okay, this is the reason why, uh, this is the reason why I don't agree with these two. Um, and I'm sure some people out there could probably could probably relate to how I look. Have you ever? Um, there's sometimes that you watch a movie trailer where you see certain scenes in it, and you expect those kernels to be there while you, when you watch this movie. Let's and jump back to Assassin's Creed Three real quick. There is a the, the trailer for Assassin's Creed Three has a scene <laughs> where you're climbing up a building and you climb into a window and there is the interior of a house and there's like a lady sitting at a table eating her dinner. I was like, I am inside a building and this is kind of new and different and crazy. And then it was like, ah, oh, this is an interesting element to the parkour. When you get into the actual game and you climb into a window, what that does is that it plays a canned animation and warps you to the other side of the building, where you run across the interior and jump out the other window. See, that's what I'm talking about, though. In a lot of movie trailers, especially nowadays, with with the way with the way just content is starting to drift towards, you see things in trailers that um, provide little kernels that make you go, "Cool, I want to watch that," and then they're not there, or they're not there in the way you expect them to be, or something of that nature. Um, when they released the the trailer for The Hobbit, everybody went up in arms. It, it was it was a big deal. Everybody was 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 really happy that Jackson was gonna come out and do another and do another part. And I personally felt that this movie hit every single kernel that they that they kind of hinted at or teased at in the trailers pretty fairly well. I mean, you still got you, you got Gollum, you got uh, you, you got the great uh, battle scenes that they just sort of hinted at in the trailer. I mean, I thought that they represented what they teased very, very appropriately. As a result thereof, I had no problems with it being as long as it was. I, I'm yeah. actually kind of there's, hoping there's, that they're going to do that with okay. the next two. This scene was not in the trailer, though. The, the bit with the trolls. The trolls in particular. <laughs> the, the little Three Stooges style bantering back and forth. That could have been a lot shorter. I liked that bantering. I'm sorry. I thought it was very well done. I, I mean, they did they did divert from canon. Um, they did make the trolls a little bit more relatable. Uh, they, 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 they don't seem as... They also changed who solved that situation. Because the way it worked... Okay, there's a couple of things. The way it worked in the book is that... They're like, Bilbo, go scout out that light in the distance. We have no idea what it is, but we are under the impression that you are a good adventurer. So you go figure that out and report back to us without giving yourself away or doing anything risky. And so Bilbo goes up and he sees that it's trolls and he's like, oh, I'm going to prove myself by pickpocketing one of them, which is a dumb idea. And then he gets caught. And then later... Two of the dwarves go wandering off looking for Bilbo, and they're like, Hey, Bilbo, where are you? And they get nabbed. And then they get nabbed two by two, and then all of them are in sacks. 
And then Gandalf totally solves the situation for everybody uh, by using ventriloquism to make the trolls debate amongst themselves. And this scene is depicted in the extended cut of the Fellowship of the Ring when they come across the stone trolls. And I, I don't know how explicitly they uh, outline the ventriloquism, but it's it was Gandalf doing ventriloquism that solved this problem. Whereas in the in the movie, it was Bilbo just sort of giving advice on how to cook dwarves, and then Gandalf smashes a rock, causing the sun to come out. Whereas it's like the moral of the troll story is kind of a rabbit in a hare thing, is that the trolls got so caught up arguing that they just stood around until the sun rose. Nobody smashed a rock behind the su behind which the sun was. It was they stood around. And the sun came up. And then... So, it's like... They changed that, which I was disappointed in, but at, at the same time, there's a lot of situations where they kept a lot of very tiny specifics, which, when they were captured by the Goblin King under the mountain, they... The Goblin was mad at the dwarves, because, like... I... My, my two cents on that bit was that, um... One, it, it makes it makes not only Bilbo but Gandalf look a little bit more competent. Yes, which which, which we kind of needed because you know you wanted to see the wizard doing freaking wizard stuff. Uh, you're <laughs> right. Okay, I would like to put this as a situation where they got things wrong, but then kind of made up for it because this scene with the trolls is Bilbo proving his adventuring prowess, <laughs> which Bilbo does and later in like... the novel. What? mostly after he's gotten the Ring of Power and is using his invisibility to prove his adventuring prowess. Yeah, which kind of, like, does that credit him or the Ring type of thing, and that's a little bit of a circle jerk there, but... <laughs> but there's... Later, they remove the parts where Bilbo proves himself, but they put in an extra part where Bilbo proves himself earlier, so it's like, uh, you've made a mistake, but then you've, you've fixed it, and this all sort of comes out in the wash. Mm. And then there was... A situation where I was afraid they were going to leave out a kind of nerdy, lore-specific, you have to be a, like, a snot-nosed nerd who lives in a basement in order to care about this. But the Goblin King was upset about the dwarves because they were intruding on his land. And the thing that sets off the goblins in the book is they see Fohammer. They see the, the two elven swords that slayed a lot of goblins a million years ago. And it, it takes them a long time to pay off the elven swords in the Hobbit movie because the trolls are already selling the dwarves out to their new enemy, Azog, who kind of has no basis in canon. They just invented an antagonist because they needed one. Mm. And, and I would say that of the changes... The Hobbit needed an antagonist. It didn't have one. It was made out of folk tales that Tolkien had collected through his wanderings of the world. And so it's it it seems like a folk tale because it is one, but as a result it didn't have an antagonist, and that doesn't make for great cinema. So they add an, an antagonist, and I approve of that. And the goblins were going to sell the dwarves to the antagonist for money. But then, like... 15 to 20 minutes later, they just happen to notice Fohammer sitting on the ground. And then they just go ape shit. Which I was like, yeah, okay. Well, this is what you're supposed to... You just see that sword and they go, what? And then they just lose it. And they're like, stomp him, smash him, kill them any way you can. It's like, we were going to, to sell you to a bounty hunter. No longer. We're just going to kick your face until you die. And so... I, I, I enjoyed that moment a lot. You know, for kids. <laughs> yes, for kids. <laughs> and visually, there's also a scene where Gandalf uses Fohammer to slice the Goblin King's belly off. And, man, that is kind of... There was another one where he decapitated a, a goblin, and then, like, he, the, the goblin was all like, whoa, what just happened? Because his head stays on, and he taps it off with his staff. I yes. thought that was like, wow, okay. This was originally this a kid's book. dark. But, uh, I, uh, once again, I liked it. <laughs> it was a funny moment, to be sure. No, yeah, I enjoyed the hell out of that. <laughs> the, there's a lot of silliness very, um... in The Hobbit 
that it was the, very uh, Veroni Kenshin a little bit. Yes, <laughs> the, there's there are a lot of underworld. The second underworld movie also has a scene where there's the people with the swords go at each other, and they're like, "I, I guess we didn't hurt each other." And then like thirty seconds later, somebody's head falls off. No, that was, oh. that was in the first movie. That, that was with, was, was uh, it in number one? Yeah, it was in number one because Victor gets his head uh, popped off with. And by, it's, uh, it's like half of his yeah, head, right? Yeah, and and because she jumps, uh, the, the main character jumps pa- past him and. Uh, uh, does the slice and he just sort of stands there like what what did what what did you do did did something happen here and then he steps forward and his head falls off so. it, only like half of his yeah, head with his like brain showing cut, yeah. and it, it is terribly gory which an underworld movie should be but the Hobbit was much sillier than the Lord of the Rings movies which it's, it it's felt a little movie. jarring but it also kind of makes sense yeah, because the Lord of the Rings books were books for adults and the Hobbit book was a book for kids. And so, the the movie is not a movie for kids, but it is silly a lot, and and the silly I, moments are funny. I would what? say even that you know the, the 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 where it takes place in the timeline is that there isn't quite that loss of innocence yet. Sure. Well, so. one thing that they did great in terms of like the silly aspect is they actually did do the musical numbers that are yes, in the book. The music, the music is amazing. Love, they did include that. that in the movie, and they did an amazing job at it. Absolutely loved the music. The, the fact in this amazing. A full rendition of That's What Bilbo Baggins Hates, complete with washing dishes. That was so, so perfect. Good. That was amazing. Tolkien is a weird nerd, <laughs> mm. and the parts where he puts songs in his books are weird and nerdy, and it's like, what's and wrong I with you, Tolkien? That. This doesn't make any sense. No, shut and up. It's like, I, no, I will fight no, you. And this, and this <laughs> is perfect. It's like, okay, I, I have told you on this podcast a number of times that Hideo Kojima has a problem in his brain. There's, there is a disease that Hideo Kojima has, and his games are weird, did you, did you, and they did don't you figure, make sense. Okay, did you figure that out in the second Metal Gear where uh, Raiden is running around naked? <laughs> or like, like really? Where, where, wherever did you get that idea? I mean, come on now. Specifically in, in Metal Gear Solid Two, actually, because Metal Gear Solid One is like totally serious oh, and yeah, normal. Metal, Metal Gear Solid Two, and then it's amazing. at Two where Kojima is like, "Okay, let me show you the inside of my head," and I'm a crazy person, and it's like. Let me show you the inside of my head, and it contains naked car wheels. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and so it's like the the songs in the Tolkien books are Tolkien being a crazy person. Kojima being crazy is why I come to Metal Gear. I I would not love Metal Gear with my heart the way I do if Kojima were just totally normal <laughs> and there was not any of this weirdness. Yeah, it'd be it'd be a Tom Clancy game if that was Basically, the case. Basically, I mean. yeah. And so the the way they could have made this so mainstream, they could have made this so palatable to all audiences would be by abandoning the sort of strange and inane musical parts. And they didn't, and I love that. It is very, very important for the integrity of what the book is. That they... they the musicals are weird, and the fact that they embrace that weirdness made it good. But it doesn't feel weird, like, when you're watching it. You, you're, you're into this, and, like, if you've read the, if you've read the book... It's it's just it's adorable. It's it's fantastic. But even I honestly think even if the the way that they did it, even if you didn't read the book, it's not too jarring. It, I mean, it, it's it's kind of cool how they do the 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 uh, musical enactment of that's what Bill Bill Baggins hates. But later they do a, uh, a the war ballad as, as as they're getting ready for everything, and that that was one cool. That one is just beautiful. It, the way, it, the, it just totally like the way it is rendered in the movie. The nobility of is not silly at all. That particular song is like, oh, there is like, inside this kind of silly movie, there is a a human struggle. I mean, they're dwarves, but it is, it it is the monomyth style thing that is wired into the human heart that all people care about being evicted from their homes. And this is something that is universal and important. Mm -hmm. Also, it helps that Benedict Cumberbatch is really pretty. Benedict yeah, think, Cumberbatch as, as far as, as far is as the, really pretty. As far as these dwarves go, like a lot of them really don't. Uh, some of them are done very, very well, but uh, and, and they look very, very dwarf like. But a lot of them really look very, fairly normal, just like short guys. I mean, it, they they didn't address it very much, but Bomber showed up 
as the fat one in a number of ways in, like, the background. Like, they would do things in the foreground, and there would be, like, almost off shot. Bomber would sit down on a chair, and the chair would break. And it'd be like, oh, Bomber, you so fat. And it's like, that is how it happened. Or, in the, or, or that is the... the, the Sort of broader way that the book also, goes. There was there was one scene where he where he actually uses his belly as a weapon and like bounced off a goblin or something of that nature, if I remember right. But yeah, no, I mean, like, I I completely I completely. Concur and there's on a that. ton of use of rack focus. I would I would it was almost bordering on abuse, but like just tons of it. None of us had the opportunity. But I I personally personally I really love rack focus. So See, I'm totally this okay is, with this. This is the reason why. I mean, you you mentioned earlier that the movie was too long. And honestly, there were scenes, there were neat little scenes like that that really didn't add anything per se in in the vast in in the, in the vast scheme of everything. But the fact that it was there made it worthwhile. It, it it gave it that extra bit of flavor. And honestly, movies nowadays lack that. Well, specifically, what I like about that treatment with Bomber is the fact that they would do it in the background while plot was happening in the foreground. Mm -hmm. Like, they would just do two things at the same time. Mm -hmm. And that is mostly what they would not do in this movie, resulting in it being so long, is they explained a lot, and Bomber was a thing that they didn't really explain, and I appreciated it for that. Uh, there's a specific scene in Judge Dredd, or Dredd was the title of the movie. The new one? That we have, the new one. Okay. That we have talked about a couple of times on the podcast, and... There's a psychic character and a traitor judge who's oh, pretending that, to be a yes. real a real we judge. Love that. And there is a scene. Should we spoil this for him? Because well, kind of I'm awesome. not gonna watch the new one, so you oh, guys okay. you guys go right ahead. This scene takes like 15 seconds. It is like okay, the traitor judges are out hunting um, Dread and his companion, and the trainee, the trainee, and there's then a traitor judge come finds the trainee in this building, and it's like. The trainee just is like, pulls out the gun and shoots the traitor judge in the face, and then it immediately cuts to another scene where plot is occurring, and it's like, you have to understand that this character is psychic. As like, I know that you're a traitor because I'm a psychic, and I just I just pulled out my gun and I shot you, and and nobody says I'm psychic. That doesn't happen in dialogue or language. You just have to sort of understand it, and it happens very quickly. And it's because it happens so quickly that it's such a good scene. Mm. And the, the the idea of not being condescended to by needing everything explained. I'd like to come up with a particular example. Oh, okay. The mark on the door. The, the, the Bilbo oh. was like, there is no mark on the door. It was painted yesterday. And what they should have done is left it at that. Because we saw Gandalf engrave the mark. There was a scene where the camera's pointing at the an door. Extreme close up. And Gandalf has his staff and he's marking the door. And, and so Bilbo's and like, then, there's no mark Thor, on the door. And then, and, then, and then, you know, shows up and is all like, hey, you know, totally found this with the help of that mark. Done. <laughs> right. But instead, what they do is uh, later, there's another scene where Bilbo is talking to Gandalf, like, how did they find my house? And Gandalf is like, I engraved a mark on the door. It's like, we know we that. Know. We saw that happen. <laughs> so we didn't need to come back to it. Maybe but, because the movie is three hours long and that was so <laughs> long ago we needed to come back to this, but no. I, is, was that there for the benefit of the people who had to get up and go to the bathroom, knowing that this was a long movie? <laughs> I'd also like to say that uh, none of us had the opportunity to see it in 3D or high frame rate. Although, I, I am very eager about the prospects of high frame rate. The media has been mixed about it. Some people don't like it, some people do. But I am of the opinion that movies being at 24 frames per second is kind of a crazy historical artifact of the fact that movies came from high-budget production companies back when cameras were extremely expensive and the technology was really crappy because it was brand new. And so people would buy these million dollar cameras that were doing 24 frames a second because that was the best they could do. And at that time they made a standard. And since then they've held to that standard because it's a standard and it makes, you know, things work together. You can use your projector with this reel and you can do this hard drive and this computer and the software. Standards make everything work together. But since then, it has been possible to do much better frame rates with cameras, and we've just sort of stuck to the old way by default. 
Um, and people have objected to high frame rate in The Hobbit on the basis of it's different. Some people have had much more substantial objections, but I... I, I've heard people complain that it looks too good, the, and therefore it does not look like a movie, and that therefore they don't like it. I, I've heard some weird Well, yeah, but what stuff was the argument, like, with that in, say, I don't know, Kirk, or, uh, Cameron's Avatar or what, what, whatnot? Well, because uh, that didn't look real. If you want to, if you want to get into the the, mm -hmm. the gist of it, it was it was it was really really pretty, and people flocked to see that. Um. Mm. Uh, well, I think there was plenty of mixed reaction to Avatar. Although Avatar, everybody was talking about the three D as the thing that is different. Yeah. Because Avatar was is the thing that brought three D into modern culture. Uh, the the prevailing meta narrative is that Avatar did 3D really well, and mm. nobody since then has used 3D quite as skillfully. I I'm not sure if I even buy into that, but that is what everybody believes. Um, the other criticism of high frame and rate, much I in the way that um, Cameron has been like kind of the champion of 3D. Jackson is now acting as the champion of the 48 frames a second. Right. This this movie like, is the one that's in the media about this topic. The way Avatar was in the like media about 3D. Like, he would show up and bring this movie to theaters and be like, this is the movie that I want you to get the projectors that can do this for. I want you to enable yeah, your technology to that. do this. I can see yeah. that. It could have been the standard that, that, that might have brought 54 frames into in the, the limelight. And... The other criticism that I've heard about uh, high frame rate is that they say it, quote, looks like a Spanish soap opera or, quote, looks like a skate video. The reason for this being that home video cameras came later in the technology cycle and did not need to adhere to the standards to which the projectors were built. And so they were like, let's do 60 frames a second because that's about what the eye is good for. And the technology can. It's easy enough. But they do it. And so, home video, such as skate videos where a dude's trying to grind a rail and he smashes his nuts, or a Spanish soap opera where they have, where they spent, like, $50 on the camera because that was their budget for the show, and they, so they're doing it on home video, are the things that people recognize as high frame rates. And so they're like, oh, this looks cheap, but it's like, well, it's because home video is cheap, but also it's better. Well, that's 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 part part of the thing is what makes good photography is not necessarily the equipment, but also the person holding it. <laughs> right, the choices made with the camera are very important, and so maybe those choices need to be different with high frame rate. Maybe they need to be the same. And with regards to even still photos, I've said it uh, probably a thousand times: that the best camera is the one that you have on you. <laughs> yes, the the one that, that works. I did that, that that you know. I might have a better camera lying around elsewhere, but if my phone's the one that I've got on me to capture this, that's what I'm going to use. <laughs> Spanish soap operas are at 60 frames because that was what they could get. They didn't have any other choices. Hmm. And so... I, and so I, when, when, it, when it's between, and we say this a lot too, <laughs> more content, always more content. Um, unless in the case of The Hobbit, in which case they're saying less content. <laughs> <laughs> We're saying context. <laughs> but actually, the trick with editing is that you want to make a movie that is 80 hours long, and then you want to take the best five minutes out of it. And just just find the absolute... Editing is an art Throw away the bad things and take the good things. Where to cut. Make, make infinity... And throw away the bad half of infinity and keep the good and just repeat this forever. And, see, and then you have you have like this too, crystal icor ambrosia of the gods. Is you just film everything and then the the really hard part comes down to editing, at least in my experience, is where you just gotta figure out what you don't use. And so it's like either either of the um scenes with the glyph on the door would have worked individually, although obviously show don't tell, the latter scene is tell and the former scene is show, and so you'd want the former scene should have been included by itself. But the the way of editing should be that the you film all of that and you make it available on a special edition DVD. Make no mistakes, you make these available as deleted scenes. 
because Blu-rays have deleted scenes on them. And deleted scenes are great if you want to watch deleted scenes. It's like, yes, this is kind of redundant and sort of paced awkwardly. So I, I want both of those. I do want more content. I never do want the less content that Paul was suggesting. I just want this content to be put in a deleted scene section rather than in the standard cut. Or maybe even in a special edition cut. But... Right, I, I have sidetracked Pixie. I forget where I was going with that. That's fine. <laughs> um, none of us have had the privilege of seeing it at high frame rate. I got wrapped up in listening to your purdy voice. <laughs> but I feel like... There was a scene where if this was an early 3D movie, they would have been throwing something at the camera. At the very end of The Hobbit, there is a scene with a bird sort of twitching around wildly. And this... It's a thrush. <laughs> well, it, and, if, and if you haven't read the book, I mean, like... It, 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 they that, highlight that right at the beginning. Well, right, right. Uh, and, and, in fact, right before the scene with it twitching. Agreed. But if you haven't read the book, uh, you'd probably look at that scene and be like, why, why was that there? Like, what was the point of that scene? Well, Except they've highlighted it twice yeah, in that same Yeah, but like movie, I said, if, if, the you, knocking if, of this the is your, is important. if this is your first time watching the movie, which for us it was, and let's say I, hypothetically you hadn't read the book before, you might go into that scene being like, what was the point of that? That was like a four second scene. Why was that there? But but there's also more details. Like, if you, if you want to fulfill the prophecy of the returning of the thrush, you can have the bird show up and it can do something other than just flail. Because what it does in this scene is go... <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it picks up like a rock or something and starts knocking. It, it's got important. like a nut and yeah, it's trying like a to... a shell or something. Uh, yeah. yeah, anyway. But it moves uh, the, very uh, rapidly. The, the, the idea is knocking. Uh, and that specific phrase is what was used in the freaking it, it, it foreshadowing is, earlier. It is the <laughs> knocking of the thrush. But knocking can be done at that pace. That's not how birds move! Also, way to clip the audio. <laughs> Only a little bit. That's in an appropriate place. But it, I feel like that scene would have looked different at high frame rates than low frame rates. Yeah. Largely my contention is that if, if there's one scene that you could isolate and be like, this is this at 48 frames per second, this is this at 24 frames per second, yeah, see how they're totally different? It is that scene. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go with that. Mm -hmm. That that's probably the tech demo is what you're saying? Yes. This is the scene that he was showing to get people to switch their projectors? Yep. You know another, you know another thing that might have been that, that might have been a reason why they didn't end up going with a, a higher frame rate is they're still using a lot of the equipment that they were using from when they uh, filmed the original when they filmed the original three movies. But no, it, the movie The Hobbit was filmed at high frame rate and yeah. it showed in a lot of locations at high frame oh, really? rate. It's a okay. matter of the theaters do not have okay. the capacity to show it gotcha, at that gotcha. rate. Okay. And so Jackson was going around going, "This is my movie that I made at this higher frame rate. I'm, I want you to upgrade your equipment to show it like this." Gotcha. Okay. If we were in New York or San Francisco, we would have had the opportunity to see it at HFR, but cool. we just didn't get to. Yes. I would have liked to. The more you know. Let's see. So, that went on for a while. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> this is an hour and three minutes. Oh, that include that is also including like the little banter bit at the beginning, but whatever. Sure. Let's see, what else do we want to talk about? Well, um... The magic of editing. We'll just clip all this. <laughs> just keep going that on. It, um, I think so, we, we film everything, and then we, got, we only take the good parts. I actually Th have this a is not one of the good parts. I actually have a caveat that I might want to throw in. Uh, I've been... For, for, for those of you that have listened to uh, Nerd Talk for a while, uh, I've been trying to get these guys to uh, review a game. Charles Barkley, <laughs> Shut called, Up and Jam Gaiden. Yes, it's called Charles Barkley, Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. It, it, to uh, be it was, fair, we played a little bit. Yeah, they played a little bit, to, but they never actually did. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you guys have not played not played this, go to talesofgames.com. It's free. It was just a couple of guys that did this off of an RPG maker, and it is great. It is so great. It is stupid. You know, I could actually funny. Do this when I get back. It is great. Paul, I promise to you on the air, like we have many times before, eventually we are going but, to play and, 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 and that's fine. That's fine. That's not, that's not my point. That's not my point. Um, little caveat, if, if you haven't played it, uh, talesofgames.com, play it. But the reason why I go into it now is um, they the talesofgames.com just kickstarted a new, uh, the, the, the sequel to it. It's called Barkley 2. 
and they've already like they they funded it within 18 hours of um of it starting and I am so psyched for this. Like, it, they, they've completely taken it away from the RPG element. They've turned it into like a, a retro shooter and everything of that nature. But it is going to be great. It's the same. It's the same company. It's the same people who did it. Um, and they have little teasers on Kickstarter or uh, Kickstarter for it. Holy uh, cow! We, it's currently at eighty-six yeah. thousand eighty-six. And, and there's still nine days to go on it. Um, and there, there's a number of goals that they have set up. Actually, if they get to uh, uh, one million two hundred thousand, they're actually going to do a Super Bowl commercial for it. Although uh, that is completely implausible, well, seeing as that they're. At ninety thousand at this point in their Kickstarter, the, the, and one million is a couple orders of magnitude away. It's 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 it's, ama it's amazing. But I am looking so forward to this game. Uh, if you uh, if you want to just have something to laugh at, jump on Kickstarter, look up Barkley Two. It's great. Um, but Barkley Two is actually not the title of this game. I mean, that's listed at the front of the Kickstarter. Mm -hmm. The title of the game is The Magical Realms of Tur N Six G Escape from Necron Seven Tur Revenge of Chukulan yeah. Chapter Two of the Hoops Barkley Saga. Tur N Six. The official game of the movie. The uh, the the Tur N Six is actually going to be the, the the main character uh, of this, and it it's going to be great. And I'm going to play the hell out of this game, and it's going to be fantastic. Um, but yeah, if you're bored and you want something free to play, uh, get on TalesOfGames.com. Download the original Barkley. It, it's it, it, it's a long it's it, it's it's kind of long, but it's fun. It, it's it's silly. It's mostly it pays, silly. Mm. It pays a lot of great homage to old RPGs. Yes, it's got it's mechanically very much a. Final Fantasy VI era JRPG. Pretty, pretty much the, the the original premise of the the game was in the post cyberpocalypse of uh, Neo New York. Um, there's a point that basketball destroys civilization, um, and uh, Charles Barkley, in, in at the at the height of this this one impressive game or whatnot, pulls off what's called a chaos dunk that like throws everything into an apocalyptic uh, uh, world and whatnot. Think and of so, the Sonic Rain Boom if the Sonic Rain Boom killed everybody. It, exactly. It's ridiculous. But it, it gets further more. So Michael Jordan and a, bu and a bunch of anti and, and the Anti-Basketball League merge forces together and they uh, create a, a basketball-free society where uh, b-ballers have to uh, um, practice their art in secret in fear of like getting executed in publicly and whatnot. It is hilarious. But anyway, um, Charles Barkley, uh, you play as Charles Barkley in this game uh, with your uh, with your illegitimate son Hoops. Um, and, uh, the the game it starts like out that would cause discrimination in this basketball hating it, it society. Abso it absolutely does. But anyway. Um, so, so it, it goes into this game, uh, uh, furthermore, and, like, one of the first scenes is, uh, Mike, is Michael Jordan and the Anti-Basketball League steal, steal your son, and you, uh, um, you meet up with the illegitimate son of LeBron James, uh, to, um, who, named, I, I believe, uh, Balthazar was his name, which was re really out of the, out of the, very out of the ordinary, but, um, pretty much, uh, you, you then proceed through this, uh, the ruins of this post-cyber apocalypse in order to get your son back. And it is great. It is so funny to, to, to go through this whole, whole bit. But, uh, anyway, caveat, caveat done. If you haven't gotten a chance to play it, it's free. It's a great, a great time. And it would, you, you have enough time to like jump into it. And maybe if you feel like it, give a little bit to, uh, the Kickstarter fund because it's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. But, I have pledged ten dollars to this particular Kickstarter, and that's going to get me the game, which means that Nerd Talk is going to play and review it eventually, probably like ten years after it comes out, judging by our status if on they, Barkley One. If they ever decide to play the first one, I mean, shoot, if you, you guys, know what? I can do this when I get home. If you guys really I wanted do to, this when I get home, you know, if you guys really wanted I'll to, I'll make the commitment. If you guys really wanted to, all you'd have to do is just like get me on Skype or something, and I'll rave about the game because it's that good. It, it's it's amazing. But anyway, that's that's for another sitting. But um, in fact, I, I will commit to this. I will totally play this when I get back to Illinois. I, you're hearing it now. I'm holding. <laughs> I'm holding this lady to what she just said. I'm going to be calling her on, on like every week on the dot until she does this. We don't know what dot, but he'll make a dot. We'll get I will a make sharpie a dot. and draw it on her. He'll, he will draw a dot on his phone with a sharpie and then call her on the dot 
Which will be constantly because the dot is on her phone. That, that, that seems a little bit excessive because I'd rather like my phone and my, I just bought that sucker. But uh, yeah, Sharpie's sure. Sharpie's super easy to clean off. You just use rubbing yeah, alcohol. It, it goes yeah, away. Alcohol. That's true. But still, I, I'd be putting it on my damn phone. I mean, household my... tips. <laughs> Did you expect that you'd get household tips when you listened to this nerd talk? Did you think you would learn how to clean Sharpie off of a phone? Now you know. <laughs> See, the funny thing is you say this because I'm, I'm reasonably certain at some point you've actually sharpened your phone. Absolutely. It, it cleans off. Like, when you put uh, rubbing alcohol on Sharpie, it pretends it was dry erase marker. It just goes away. It's great. Mm-hmm. I think that puts us at an hour. All right. So, uh, next show, what are we doing and when are we doing it? <laughs> uh, Eventually. I would still like to talk more in depth about Skyfall at some point. When we have Jeff here, seeing as that we've... Jeff has also seen it twice. So we, we have watched this movie more than probably we've watched many other movies. Probably true. <laughs> we may as well analyze the heck out of it. I might have to go see it again just to get a refresher, though. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. On the little details. <laughs> Can't get For enough that James matter, Bond. have we talked very much about XCOM? Also, I'm fairly certain I fell asleep at one of those showings. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. You can fall back on the other one. <laughs> XCOM, I believe Sen might have talked about it, but you I, are I totally suspect we will have so. more to say because I don't think he beat it last time we talked about it, and yes. I have played the vast majority of it since then. So next time is Skyfall and XCOM. That'll probably give us a lot. Yep. Sounds good. All right. Um, thank you for joining us, Paul, for this Absolutely. very special episode of Nerd Talk. Thank I'm you for Fixie. having me. And I'm PyroSim. And Sen will be back whenever he gets the chance. Uh, in the meantime, you can like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash nerdtalk. You can follow me on Twitter at nerdtalkpixie or Pyro here at PyroSim. Uh, Sen also has a Twitter that he will never use, so there's no point. <laughs> Is Overlord Sen if you are like a nerd who wants to follow a Twitter account that has no tweets on it. <laughs> if you are a nerd who wants to follow a Twitter account that has one tweet on it, then follow one tweet. One tweet Pete, who ha- who has one tweet. That's pretty great. <laughs> I follow him. He's never going to tweet again because he's one tweet Pete. But it's great. And on that note, I'm Pixie. And I'm Pyrosim. I'm Paul. And you've been listening to Nerd Talk. <laughs>